This is Orsi, official old guy at oldguytalkstome.com, a podcast dedicated to helping older guys create kick-ass lives for themselves and those that they love. It's for women, too. Each week, I bring you a special guest to help you create that life that you imagine for yourself and those that you love. We talk anti-aging medicine, personal growth, relationships, and sex, vices, and other topics that many don't want to talk about but need to. Just because you're getting older doesn't mean you have to be old. Also, if you want to know three ways to get laid more frequently without begging, go to oldguytalks.com and opt in. When you do, you're going to get my informative video on three simple things you can do to get laid more frequently without begging so you don't have to turn in your man card. And ladies, you may want your man to know these things because I think you'll like them too. Additionally, you'll be notified weekly when a new podcast episode is ready for you to consume. Periodically, I will share with you other stuff that will help you create that life that you want for yourself and those that are important to you. Don't want to miss anything? Be sure to subscribe, share, and review this podcast. Be sure to listen to part two, where we talk about James Stern's role at Wind Properties as head of security. This is Orsi Official Old Guy at oldguytalkstome.com, a podcast dedicated, I mean, dedicated to helping older guys create kick-ass lives for themselves and those that they love. You can't forget those that you love. And today, as a guest, I got a special guest. He's got a very, very interesting story, a very, very interesting history. Jim Stern, former FBI agent, former U.S. intelligence officer, uh, former uh, head of security, I'll call it head of security at the Wynn Gaming Resorts, and he's also still now working in the security business in Japan, and he has a very, very interesting, uh, where he's been an undercover agent, uh, dealt with investigations right after 9-11, uh, interrogating terrorists and finding out more about what's going on there, and a whole bunch of other stuff. He's had a very, very interesting uh, history, but uh, so welcome, welcome, Jim. How are you doing today? Thank you for having me. I'm doing fine. Thank you. Great, great, great. So uh, I always like to ask my guests to start off with something a little bit different from what they normally get. What is the most important thing you did today? The most important thing I did today was making sure that my dogs were happy. They were, they got their walk and their exercise. And that makes me happy. When my dogs are happy, I'm happy. All right. That sounds good. That's <laughs> You got to keep, especially if you got dogs. What kind of dogs do you have? I have four dachshunds. Oh, wow. You got a lot. You got, you got a pack. Four, four dachshunds, and uh, they're good dogs, and uh, they mean a lot to me. So I make sure that they get their walks and they're taken care of and, and whatnot. So it's something that I make sure on a daily basis that they're good to go. All right. Well, great. Well, great. Well, Jim, how did you, uh, how did you get into law enforcement? Where, how, how did that journey start for you? Well, I grew up in San Pedro, California, and most of my friends growing up in San Pedro in the 60s, uh, you typically become a fireman, a policeman, a longshoreman. Those are kind of the, the tier A occupations uh, mm -hmm. for, uh, growing up in San Pedro. And I used to watch the old FBI show as we all did on Sunday nights with Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. Oh yeah, the FBI. Exactly. And uh, God, gee, I wonder how hard it is to get into something like that. So I would actually send for applications from the FBI when I was 10, 11 years old. I sent a letter. This is how you communicated in the 60s. And they would send me back an actual brochure and, and criteria to become an FBI agent. I would show my mom and my sisters and they were thinking, okay, well, you're a little bit young for that, but that's almost unattainable because it's something that, you know, very, very few people ever can get into the FBI. In fact, we knew nobody was in the FBI. So I thought, well, okay, well, I'm going to try. When somebody usually tells me I can't do something, that just makes me motivated to try harder. So, uh, after high school, uh, I was in the army for uh, three years active duty and I got out and I went to college, went to USC, graduated and I applied to the FBI 
and I was able to pass the entrance exam and get a pretty good score. So I got an appointment letter to go to the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia in the summer of 1982. And I graduated in September of 1982. And I was a brand new FBI special agent that year. Okay. Well, that's kind of, kind of an interesting journey. Now, uh, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, <laughs> I have a particular sensitivity about this. Not sensitivity, but kind of a, a laugh about this. Uh, my father-in-law, uh, who was fluent in several Eastern European languages in Germany, uh, because he was fluent in those when he was in the Air Force, and he was a, a stationed in, originally stationed in uh, Tucson uh, under Curtis LeMay, uh, because he was fluent in Eastern European languages and German, uh, after he left Davis Mountain Air Force Base, they sent him to Japan, which was makes perfect sense. <laughs> and so, so because uh, you are fluent in Japanese, of course, the military would send you to uh, Southern Italy and work with NATO. So tell us a little about that experience. So when I joined the Army, I went to basic training at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And my next assignment for my what they call advanced individual training, AIT, was at Fort Gordon, Georgia. I went through a signal school and as a communication specialist. And while I was at signal school, uh, the intelligence uh, branch came and pulled about a half a dozen of us out of training and said, look, are you guys interested in becoming and uh, going into the intelligence branch? And we weren't quite sure what that meant. We were 18 years old at the time. And they said, well, uh, you're gonna have to get a higher security clearance and we will try to get you assigned where you were supposed to be assigned after this training period. Um, I was supposed to go to the 32nd Air Defense in Germany as a communication specialist. And I was worried that I wouldn't go to Europe uh, because if I transitioned into this intelligence field, uh, I would probably possibly lose my permanent party assignment, which is what they called it back then. So I said, okay, uh, and the other guys uh, and gals did as well. So we passed our security clearance, background investigation, and of course we finished our signal school, but the background investigation took longer than the actual signal school training. So we were staying at Fort Gordon, Georgia, just doing, doing miscellaneous you know, duties, guard duty, KP duty, et cetera. So those of us out there and the former veterans, they know about the uh, kind of the collateral duties that you get thrown into. So they finally uh, got us all cleared and they generally tried to station us where we had been guaranteed to be stationed had we not gone into the intelligence branch. Uh, and uh, they said to me, you're going to Naples. And my first thought was, oh, I'm going to Florida? Is there an army base down there? <laughs> go, no, Naples, Italy, you idiot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, I went to uh, Naples, uh, Italy, got on a, uh, a Mack flight from Philadelphia International Airport flew to uh, Naples and I was assigned to a military intelligence uh, unit there where we wore civilian clothes. And interestingly, the, the commander, Supreme Allied Commander of Europe at the time was General Alexander M. Haig. So we all know uh, sure. General Haig later was uh, the Secretary of State in the Reagan administration, et cetera. Um, but he was the Supreme Allied Commander. And then the four-star Admiral down at the NATO base that I was assigned to was Stansfield Turner. And he later, when Jimmy Carter was elected president um, in uh, 76, uh, he was pulled back as the CIA director. So uh, there was a lot going on in uh, NATO at that time. But as a young uh, enlisted uh, army soldier uh, who was wearing civilian clothes, uh, doing intelligence work as a 18, 19, 20 year old. It was quite the responsibility, uh, the stuff that we were doing, which I can't get into the specifics of what we were doing, but we were protecting NATO. And there was a, a bit of terrorism that was going on back in the seventies. It wasn't the Al Qaeda era. It was more of the Bider Meinhof gang and uh, red brigades and things mm -hmm. like that that were going on. Uh, but uh, it was a good career uh, in, an assignment with NATO, 
and in uh, 1978, I, my army career uh, was up and I was going to re-enlist, but my, uh, my mom wanted me to go to college, like my two older sisters. They were both at USC, University of Southern California. My mom said, you need to go to college. So I stayed in the reserves for three years while I went to USC and actually contemplating, having grown up in LA, I wanted to go into LAPD, LA County Sheriff's, really great departments uh, uh, at the time. And, um, you know, just want to be a police officer. But uh, when I got my college degree, I thought, well, maybe I'll try out uh, and see about the federal system. So I applied to the Secret Service, the US Marshals, uh, and the FBI and the Bureau came first. So I joined, fortunately passed the test and I went through training at the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia. Yeah. So, uh, so you were not too damaged by your uh, experience as a student at the University of Spoiled Children. <laughs> well, I can tell you right now, uh, I grew up in San Pedro mm -hmm. and my mom was a hairdresser for 40 years. And I went to USC on the GI Bill yeah. Uh, and I was not driving a BMW at USC like a lot of yeah. my classmates. I was there in a Mustang. And, yeah. uh, so I was, and I worked in the VA office at USC as well for extra money. So I was a pretty normal student at a school that has the reputation of spoiled kids. Uh, yeah. And, but, uh, and I, I was there for two years, actually, a few years after you. I was there from 83 to 85. And, yeah. uh, and it was, it was, there's no, the, the, that moniker, University of Spoiled Children, at least from my perspective, really fits for, for, for a good portion of the students. I mean, my, one of my classmates for graduation, uh, she got an XJ7 and so did her sister too, the Jaguars. They each got Jaguars for their graduation present. Uh, <laughs> well, when you, when you grow up uh, in a single fam, a single parent family and yeah. uh, somebody who's working as a hairdresser uh, for, for decades, you're pretty grounded and yeah. I was lucky that the GI Bill paid for a lot of my education. I worked part time to supplement. So uh, I was uh, not at the uh, I was at USC, not the University of Spoiled Children. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So uh, so uh, in your career, you, know, you had a number of different roles in the, in the FBI and one of them made you famous. You're, you're a TV star uh, when you went undercover for the uh, Yakuza. Uh, or not for the, uh, to try to, to infiltrate the Yakuza and their, their uh, drug trafficking. Uh, before we get into that story, could you give us a little background on the, the Yakuza uh, crime syndicate and their code of honor and, and who they, and what their history is? Yeah, so, you know, the Yaku, Yakuza. Yakuza, uh, okay. The, uh, they're, they're called, in Japan, you, they're, they're called the Boryokudan. So the Yakuza is slang. Uh, Yakuza. That actually, Yakuza means eight nine three. It's twenty. It's a losing hand in a Japanese game. So it literally means loser. It's a uh, but people know as Yakuza. But the proper name is Boryokudan, and Boryokudan is the Japanese organized crime that's been around since the seventeenth century, uh, and it's been around for a lot of years, obviously. Uh, starting off uh, hundreds of years ago with gambling and things like that. Uh, it's transitioned over the decades and even centuries into very organized, uh, organized crime, uh, if you will, um, throughout Japan. And they're involved in a multitude of criminal uh, violations and, and things that uh, from drug trafficking to uh, white collar crime and this day and age, uh, they're involved in internet stuff, uh, cyber crimes, et cetera. So uh, they're, they're doing a lot. When I got assigned as a young FBI supervisor in Honolulu in the 90s, early 90s, we, we saw an increase in crystal methamphetamine, which they call ICE. Uh, in Japanese, it's called uh, It's It's methamphetamine, but crystallized. And they were, the Japanese and other criminal organizations in Asia were bringing ice, very expensive ice uh, into the West coast of the US and notably into Hawaii. So we decided to launch a undercover operation to target the uh, uh, traffickers of this ice into Hawaii. Cause when, when you bring crystal meth into Hawaii, the users of crystal meth 
generally have to commit a crime, a lot of crime in order to pay for the very expensive crystal methamphetamine. So while crystal meth was kind of the drug of choice for users in the Hawaiian islands in the early nineties, that's when kind of the crack was going on in the, in the US mainland. But uh, there's a huge difference in price between crystal meth and crack. So we were seeing an inordinate number of bank robberies and violent crimes in Hawaii, which when people think of Hawaii, they think of just vacations and beauty and, and it has all that, uh, it's beautiful. But there's also a, a side that's you know not good, they have a lot of crime. And a lot of these bank robbers and other violent criminals were having to commit criminal activities to get a lot of money to pay for very expensive ice. You know, when you, when you rob a 7-Eleven, you get X amount of dollars. When you rob a bank, you get more dollars. Sure. So we were seeing an, uh, an increase in violent crimes like that. And so we decided to go after the source of the crystal meth, which uh, in this case was the Japanese mob. Yeah. So now you had uh, encountered a, a low level, uh, I'll try to give the Yakuza uh, thug for lack of a better description and, uh, and got him to be, uh, got him to bring you some, uh, some, some ice in order to, uh, to do a transaction. Tell us a little bit, cause that, that was a pretty interesting transaction, uh, especially with the knives. Well, so like, like most, uh, criminal investigations, usually the predication is a, a source or, or somebody that can actually be domino one in your investigation. So mm -hmm. we had, we had good sources that introduced, uh, undercover FBI people, notably me, uh, to the source of ice. And this person was a trafficker, low level organized crime member who was a trafficker. And so uh, I ended up, uh, discussing uh, the transaction with this low level person. Uh, and I developed a friendship, uh, an undercover friendship with this person, trying to get him to do a larger transaction culminating in higher level Yakuza, unlike this low level guy I was dealing with, to come to Hawaii uh, so we could go and get the top of the hierarchy and when you when you're going after a criminal enterprise, the goal is always to get the top people. Mm -hmm. but you typically have to start at the bottom in order to get to the top. So we were successful at the bottom, and we had hopes of getting to the top of the criminal enterprise that we're bringing in crystal meth into Hawaii, mm -hmm. and we were able to succeed in that endeavor. Yeah. So you, you had a uh, you had a successful transition of, of money, if I, if I recall correctly, and then you went out to a, uh, uh, I guess would be the equivalent of a Benihana, where uh, things got a little uh, dicey. Right. So we, we went, I, I, during the course of my undercover relationship with the bad guy, um, we talked a lot, we went for cocktails, but we went to dinner and we went to a uh, Benihana's. And as you, if you've ever been to Benihana's, you know that when you sit at a Benihana's, you could randomly sit at a table with people you don't know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the tables are surrounded and the guy, the cook is, uh, they're cooking and he's putting on a show and everything. And so me and the Yakuza were sitting at the table with a family uh, of, with three grown kids. And the Yakuza was drinking so much that he started to take a shirt off and he was showing off his tattoos. Now picture this, here, here you're at a dinner, you're in Honolulu, and the, uh, a person at your table, this community table, if you will, uh, one person starts taking their clothes off and showing off these tattoos. And I was kind of embarrassed. I was not only uh, concerned with somebody calling the police and having the Honolulu Police Department say, hey, aren't you the FBI? Uh, and then blow the whole operation. Mm -hmm. Oh, so I, I just told the guy to, hey, look, you can't do that in America. You know, sit your ass down. So I pulled at him and he didn't like that. So he pulled a knife on me. And uh, I, uh, for some reason, my instincts kicked in to, to transition the topic into, hey, look, put the knife down. 
relaxed. You're a little shit faced. Let's uh, let's go to a strip club after this thing. And he bought into that uh, hook, line, and sinker. So we went to the strip club after dinner. He relaxed, put his clothes back on, and I couldn't take. He wanted me to take my clothes, my shirt off, which. I got to take my shirt off, even if I'm not in an undercover role. I got to take my shirt off in a restaurant. So sure. I couldn't do it because I was recording the conversation with a body recorder and mm-hmm. it was on my chest. And that would have blown the whole operation. And back in the early 90s, body recorders were a little bit different than they are now. You get micro cassettes and, and whatever. But back then, it was about as big as an iPhone taped to my chest. Sure. So uh, I, I slid out of that, you know situation we went to a strip bar and of course he had a lot of money because i just bought ice for tens of thousands of dollars i think we we gave him sixty seventy thousand dollars wow. he brought uh a lot to the strip bar and he was paying those strippers hundred dollar bills to dance for him not a dollar but a hundred dollars so um, well, very popular i'm sure every stripper in that place was surrounding he and i with his money that I paid him for the crystal meth earlier in the day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 was, that, was, that was quite the scene. So you were able to uh, basically get him to uh, uh, sell you some drugs. And the next step was to try to bring in a higher ranking member out of the crime syndicate. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So we tried to get, I knew I was dealing with a low level member of the Yakuza. So we wanted to, to uh, get to a higher level. So we were, we were tapping his phones and we were watching him, et cetera. And he was making phone calls. So we knew we were making progress, <clears throat> excuse me, to, uh, to potentially have his, his boss, who was the boss of the entire organization, come to Hawaii to do a multi-kilo million dollar deal that a low level guy like that would never do. He was, I want, I want to clarify, he was actually the boss of the whole organization or just that, or, or that's, that's, that's wild that you were able to get him to the United States. Yeah, he uh, probably coming to Hawaii had something to do with it, but uh, he, he came in with his wife and, uh, but yeah, we were, we wanted to do a 20 kilo deal and uh, that's millions of dollars. So uh, I don't think they trusted the low level guy, the low level guy that I was dealing with to do that kind of a deal. Uh, so he wanted to come himself to kind of see who is this guy dealing with me? Uh, what are the ramifications, et cetera? Uh, because you don't become a boss if you're stupid and reckless. You become mm-hmm. a boss because you're smart and you're aggressive. And so this guy wanted to meet me. And luckily we were wiretapping the phones uh, in the hotel. This is before the era of everybody having a cell phone, you know, early 90s. Um, and we were listening to their conversations. And we knew that, that he was trying to convince his boss that I was okay and uh, let's do a bigger deal. Come to Honolulu. It's great. I've got money for the transaction that we've already done. This guy is a, uh, I was portraying myself as kind of a money guy, uh, jack of all trades. I can get things done. Sure. Uh, and I had a lot of money. So the uh, low level guy that I was dealing with convinced his boss to come to Hawaii because I was okay and I was going to be able to pay them a, a lot of money for a lot of ice. And we needed to discuss the logistics of that. It's one thing to bring crystal meth on your body secreted, but it's another thing to bring multi kilos in. So that would have taken a little bit of, uh, you know, effort. Sure. Sure. Did you so know that there you- are 76 additives that have been approved by the FDA that can be added to your wine? Do you want a wine that's been produced without additives? Because there's no shit that you don't know about in there. Well, you can get that. Go to www.oldguytalks.com backslash dry farms. Farms with an S, all one word. And get some wines that are free of additives, that are made organically. And with your initial purchase, you can buy a bottle of wine for one penny. That's right start the pleasure in the hell. Sure. So what was the, uh, the, the end result of that was with, with the, uh, with the boss that came into town, what, what happened there? So the, the boss came and we initially, before we did a 20 kilo deal, we wanted to do a, a, a multi kilo deal, two or three kilos. And 
uh, the boss, uh, Yoshimura, brought, he had a, a child of a, another associate of his bring the crystal meth kilos secreted inside of miso base. So, you know, you know, miso soup is popular in a Japanese restaurant, right? Right. But miso base, very thick. And it's what you use to make miso soup, obviously. Right. So it's, it's, they had the crystal meth kilos secreted inside of raw miso and concealed in plastic and in a bag and carried by a young girl to get through us customs. Now, again, this is before 9-11. So sure. the uh, airport people are basically U.S. Customs and U.S. Immigration, which were two different agencies at the time. There was no Customs Border Protection, DHS, uh, in the 90s. That was formed after 9-11. Uh, and the uh, sophistication of bringing the kilos of ICE through Honolulu U.S. Customs was not that sophisticated. It was a little girl carrying a bag bag of miso miso which was covering the kilos of ice sounds pretty amazing so eventually you, you you went on with your negotiations uh with this boss and uh how did that culminate what, what, what was the end of all that discussion well the, the the boss started to get leery of me and uh, he was because we, I didn't, we, we, the, the, in the initial transaction, uh, we let money walk, meaning that uh, the, the low level Yakuza gave me the ice, I gave him the cash, and we both went our separate ways. Well, we went to dinner, I went to the strip club, et cetera. But the next transaction was going to require about a quarter million dollars to walk if we would have done that. And we were having some, some issues getting $250,000. Again, this is, you know, 30 years ago, $250,000 is a lot of money in 19. It was a lot of money now, but back then it was more money. And we were having trouble convincing uh, our headquarters to allow that level of money to walk, meaning that they give me the kilos, I give them the ice, and then we start talking about a 20 kilo deal, which we would never let millions of dollars go, which that would be the, the cost of multi, multi kilos. But so the boss started getting a little bit. Uh, I would say he, he was starting to scrutinize. Okay, wait a minute. How are they going to do a 20 kilo deal when they can't even do a two kilo deal? Um, mm -hmm. And so he, we were, thank God we were listening to their conversations and we were afraid that they're going to flush those kilos down the toilet in the hotel. Mm -hmm. So we decided that we had enough evidence because U.S. Attorney's Office, in the District of Hawaii, you know, they prosecute the cases that federal law enforcement agencies bring to them. And so we were working with them hand in hand to see if we had gleaned enough evidence uh, from the electronic surveillance, the wiretaps, et cetera, to be able to affect an arrest of the boss um, without having to continue with letting a quarter million dollars walk on the kilo deal or having to talk more about the 20 kilo deal. But the U.S. Attorney's Office felt that they had enough evidence. So we took it down uh, at that point for all those reasons. Yeah. And it was significant enough because um, the uh, all the subjects pled guilty. We never went to trial. Okay. I'm sure that was part of a plea deal or something like that. It was more than, yeah, I remember it was a plea deal. And we went to Japan after to talk to other members of that criminal enterprise. And uh, it was... You know, interesting when you conduct investigations in Japan as a U.S. law enforcement officer or agent, um, you have to, to ensure that the proper protocols are in place. You just can't go there and start interviewing people. You have to make sure you go through the Department of Justice, the State Department, the National Police Agency of Japan, etc. So we interviewed some, some members of that criminal organization uh, and they talked to uh, us through their interpreter, through the State Department, through the Japanese police. Um, and I remember the, uh, the underboss actually apologized to me, which I couldn't believe he apologized to me. He says uh, something to the effect of, um, I'm sorry that our Yakuza organization 
caused the FBI so much grief. I was thinking, did this guy just apologize to me because <laughs> the FBI arrested this boss and whatever? And, but that's the honor code of the Yakuza and just in Japan in general. Like you never hear of a criminal organization in the United States. You arrested the boss, the, num the number two guy apologizing to the law enforcement agency for, for any trouble. You just, I'd never heard of that before, yeah, yeah. but it happened in Japan. Yeah. So how long did, what kind of sentences did they receive? Um, they, they pled out. I, I believe the top guy was uh, in prison for, uh, six, seven, eight years, somewhere in there. And, uh, the other guy, I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. there were some other, uh, ancillary people that were arrested, but the top guy, uh, he pled out and he got a pretty good deal. He served his federal time, uh, and he went back to Japan after he got out. Okay. All right. Um, you ever worry about the retribution or him coming back in, in your life? No, no. No, and, and everybody asks me that question. Uh, so, you know, any law enforcement officer, whether you're state, local, federal, um, you know, if you're working, uh, you know, you're on the you're working bank robberies or kidnappings, extortions, white collar crime, whatever. You know, you put people in jail. Think, oh, is that guy when he gets out of jail, is he going to uh, come back and do harm to you? Yeah, well, it's always a little bit in the back of your mind. But if you worry about that, you're in the wrong occupation. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. So well, uh, we move on to something different. You were, uh, when 9-11 happened, mm -hmm. uh, you were a, uh, a specialist in, uh, in polygraph examination and interrogation. And you interrogated uh, people who uh, were working on terrorism. Uh, tell us about what your experiences were in that, in, in that, when you were in that area. And so in the, in the late 90s, uh, the FBI trained me to be a polygraph uh, examiner. And with that, you're, you learn a lot of skill sets, not only how to operate a polygraph, uh, but to learn about nonverbal communication, interrogation techniques, et cetera. Uh, and when you're a polygraph examiner, typically in the FBI, there's one polygraph examiner per office, except for the larger offices like Los Angeles or Chicago, New York. Mm -hmm. like, they might have more than one, but most, average FBI officers have one examiner. So you're kind of one-on-one. So you do all the exams uh, from uh, people who are trying to get jobs at the FBI uh, or criminal cases where uh, they need a, a polygraph of a suspect uh, in some way. It's an investigative tool. Um, so I was doing a lot of terrorism polygraphs before 9-11 uh, in Pakistan, uh, places like that where there were a couple of very uh, serious cases uh, in uh, killing uh, U.S. citizens uh, in 1995 and 1997. So I did polygraphs on those cases. When 9-11 hit, it, of course, it changed the, uh, uh, the foundation of, of everything that we did uh, in law enforcement. It was an unprecedented time. So uh, because I was the examiner who kind of had that region out uh, in those locations, Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka, and Nepal. I did a lot of exams uh, through 2002, 2003, uh, terrorism exams that uh, would come up uh, on a multitude of international terrorism related uh, issues. And when you do it, an exam like that in Pakistan or other parts of that, that those parts of the world, you need an interpreter because I don't speak Hindi, Punjabi, Urdu, Arabic. Uh, so you have to go with a translator. And when you do a polygraph, there's only supposed to be two people in the room, the examiner and the examinee, period. The only exception is an interpreter. That's the only exception. So you see these Sometimes you, I, I see these uh, polygraph examiners on these, uh, these entertainment shows doing a test in front of a studio audience or, you know, it's just like, no, it's not a real polygraph. Mm -hmm. uh, real polygraph, you need to make sure that everything is set uh, with the examinee. You need to make sure that you get proper psychological set. Polygraph's based on your autonomic nervous system. It's your automatic response system that everybody has. Uh, and so it's not just about connecting somebody 
and running an exam. Uh, a lot of these tests take hours and hours to do to make sure that you get proper physiological traces from tracings from proper physiological reactions to certain questions that you give the examinee. Relevant questions about what you're testing them, testing this person about, and control questions to enhance the overall test. And that's how polygraph works. And the Department of Defense runs an outstanding training, which is what I went through. All the federal agents who Secret Service, FBI, DEA, uh, et cetera, they all go through the Department of Defense training, the federal school. And it's, in my opinion, the creme de la creme uh, wow. of polygraph training. They just, anytime the military and the U.S. government's involved, you know, cost is never an issue. So uh, there, there's really good training. It's yeah. very tough too. I did that for six years from uh, 98 to uh, 2004. When you were doing it, was there anything when you were dealing with terrorists, um, was there anything that surprised you when you were doing these, these interrogations? Was there something like different that you, that, that, that you found different about these people or anything that surprised you in, 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 in doing these tests? Yeah, so when, when you're dealing with any foreign national in a polygraph, you have to make sure that you understand culturally how they tick, you know, because mm -hmm. somebody from Nebraska doesn't react like somebody from Karachi, Pakistan. It's a different right. background, different ethnocentric system, different way of thinking, different everything. So you have to make sure that you transition because if you get into this robotic way of doing things only from a U.S. perspective, you're not going to be very good at doing international polygraph interrogations. You need to transition to international. Take off your domestic cap, put your international cap on. I did a lot of exams overseas, all over, from uh, you know Nepal to Sri Lanka to Pakistan to India, you name it, I was there. And uh, they were all unique in and of themselves. They all require you to transition to the location that you're at. A polygraph in Pakistan is not the same as a polygraph in Thailand. And a polygraph in Thailand is not the same as a polygraph in Sri Lanka. Because it's international, it doesn't mean that it's one-stop shopping. So you have to really indoctrinate yourself into culture, into language, into idiosyncrasies, uh, into a lot of different things. And without getting into a four-hour discussion on polygraph, there is a method to this madness. You, you need to make sure that you glean and extrapolate enough data for you to lay out what we call control questions that help with the polygraph examination. If you don't do that, it won't be effective. Okay, all right. And the last thing you want, because polygraph is not DNA 100%. Right. It's an investigative tool. It's an investigative technique. So you don't want a false positive. You don't want a false negative. And you don't want inconclusive. So there's there's three results, basically. There's NDI, no deception indicated, DI, deception indicated, or INC, inconclusive. So it's A, B, or C. If you're INC, inconclusive, that's typically the examiner didn't probably do a thorough job. But when you get a DI, deception indicated, which is a, a fail, so the person failed, or an NDI, no deception indicated, which is a pass, you want to make sure that you didn't get the opposite of what's reality as well. So you don't want a false positive or a false negative. So there's a lot writing on uh, a, an investigative tool that is not, again, I always use the word DNA, 100% science. It's a tool that will eliminate people as much as it's a tool that will help investigators pursue things. Uh, so it goes both ways. I've eliminated suspects with polygraph as much as I have got them to confess to polygraphs. And, and a lot of people think, oh, that doesn't work. It's kind of uh, hocus pocus and this and that. Well, it's not. Uh, it's an investigative tool based on science, based on physiology, based on research. And it's been around for a long, long time. The only thing that's changed about polygraphs is the equipment. You know, mm -hmm. it's gone from analog to digital to computer, but the technique is still the same. And I, re I remember the second exam I ever did. Now, I went to polygraph school um, and 
I was an FBI agent for 16 years at the time. So I was a pretty seasoned investigator like my other FBI colleagues at the Polygraph Institute. And when I got back to Honolulu and started doing polygraphs, um, remember what the second exam that I did was a sexual assault case. And I remember, you know, before you actually connect the person and run the test, you interview them, et cetera. And my antenna was up thinking, oh, I think this guy's going to pass the test. Uh, he doesn't have any of those tier A uh, things that you look for in somebody who's committed this type of crime. And so I connected him. I did the test and he flunked about as bad as you can flunk. And I was thinking, oh, this is my second test. And I'm thinking, oh my God, this, uh, this guy flunked this test. But my investigative radar says that he probably didn't do it. Well, take your investigative radar up, believe in your polygraph, believe in your charts, believe in the data. So I called back to uh, FBI headquarters and I told them that what I had, and they told me to fax the charts to them and they analyzed them. They said they came back half an hour later. In the meantime, I'm watching a guy in my polygraph suite, just sitting there twiddling the stones. And they told me, you did a good exam. You got good questions. You got good tracings. He flunked. Go in there and interrogate and get a confession. Okay. So I did. Went in there. An hour later, I got a full confession. Confessed to everything. And I um, was thinking, geez, this really does work. Because my initial investigative intuition would have been, yeah, this guy probably, you know, he, he just doesn't have all those things that you typically see in this type of a crime. But when I polygraphed him, he flunked and I got him to confess, give me a full signed confession in his writing. And that's when I knew that polygraph worked. Mm -hmm. That was sure. my second exam. First one was the, the person applying for a job. My second one was a criminal test. It was that one. And if it was very fulfilling too, to get a guy to confess to something that without the polygraph, never would have got there. Mm -hmm. Sure. That's interesting. interesting. So be sure to listen to part two, where we talk about James Stern's role at Wynn Properties as head of security. Thanks for joining me on this podcast. If you like what you heard and learned, then be sure to do three things. One, subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. Two, share this with someone who may need to hear it also. And it may be your significant other. And three, review it give me a good review. If you didn't like it, give me a bad review. I don't care. Just review me and be sure to get my free video on three ways to get laid more frequently without begging. Opt in at oldguytalks.com. Don't be that guy that just takes in the information. Take action. Without action, you're not going to get the results you want.